but this was disregarded. In this review, antibiotic retreatment of Lyme disease in patients with persistent symptoms, it showed that there was a benefit. And this is, this is the study. Out of four randomized controlled trials, they met the inclusion criteria, the efficacy of IV ceftriaxone versus placebo in three to six months. And they were found to be, two of them found to be underpowered and unrealistic to detect meaningful changes. One of them, which was Krupp, was found to be well-designed, analyzed for fatigue, which was found to be statistically significant, but also the other was Fallon, which found that it had sustained improvement in cognitive abilities. The primary outcome at 12 weeks, which was not sustained after 24 weeks because treatment was stopped, but improvement of physical functioning and pain were demonstrated at four weeks, and that this showed that treatment is beneficial. This review that retreatment can be beneficial, that primary outcomes originally reported as statistically insignificant were likely underpowered. The positive treatment effects of ceftriaxone are encouraging and consistent with continued infection a hypothesis deserving additional study and additional studies of persistent infection and antibi antibiotic treatment are warranted. If anyone wants, you know, this article as an as a article to, you know, at least show someone who would consider not treating, this is, is a good article to, uh, to show. So what's the progress? First off, they said it was a new disease, which it isn't. Uh, then it was thought to be viral, which it isn't. Then it was once only transmitted by the tick, which it no longer is considered. Um, then it was thought that seronegativity didn't exist, which it does. Then it was thought that it was easily treated by short courses of antibiotic, which sometimes it isn't. If you look throughout the history of Lyme disease, almost every time a major dogmatic statement has been made about what we know about the disease, it was subsequently proven wrong and underwent major modifications. So patient history. A well patient who became ill after a potential exposure Occupational travel history can be very important. Exposure to pets, domestic and wild, family members and pets with Lyme. The evolution of symptoms over time. They're nonspecific. Viral symptoms persist. New ones appear. Migratory arthritic conditions. You have pain in your joints, in your neck one day, and then in your shoulder another day, and then in your wrist another day. That's kind of the hallmark of Lyme. Migratory arthritis. Musculoskeletal pain, peripheral and central nervous systems, and it can progress to whole system and multi-system illnesses. The symptom intensity tends to wax and wane, and it typically changes in a three to six week life cycle. Anywhere from three, four, five, six weeks. This is a typical story. Before I was ill, I worked as an accountant. I liked my job. I was good at it. I welcomed caring for my children and looked forward to the times of joy and engagement with my friends and family. Now it is impossible for me to get out of bed. I am so tired, I can't think straight. My sleep is turbulent, having severe headaches, dizziness, and body aches. My vision is impaired. These symptoms come and go, and I never know when it may come. My arms and legs hurt all the time, migrating from one joint to the next, and I cry without reason. I don't know who I am. I'm scared. When will I feel better? Please just tell me I will. Chronic Lyme disease. Unless typical presentation, the percent of patients being diagnosed at their first doctor's visit is less than 2%. We actually hit our all-time record. Uh, where we saw a patient who actually has seen 47 physicians. But it is not uncommon that patients see eight, nine, 
physicians until they come to the diagnosis. Now, I will tell you, I, I, I want to now talk about my colleagues. They want to care for you. They really do. There is, there is a concern out there that they will be um, vilified by the medical community, by the boards, and that concern has made them less willing to hear your story and more willing to really advise you to seek another expert. Go to a rheumatologist, a psychiatrist, an orthopedist, a neurologist. Typically, they may even say go to an infectious disease doctor although they know that most of those, at least in this area, will say, we don't, we don't believe that chronic Lyme disease. And I also believe that they, as physicians, whether you're an infectious disease doc or a rheumatologist, they want to do the best to care for you. They are limited within their own guidelines. As an ER physician, if ASEP, the board of medicine that I work under in the ER, said to me, that you can't treat people like this. Let's give an example. The Framingham Heart Study came out in the 1970s. What it suggested was that women don't really get heart disease prior to menopause, that it just doesn't really exist. And therefore, most of the times that they come in complaining of shortness of breath or inability to walk far without getting shortness of breath or maybe some twinges in their shoulder or, or jaw is most likely hysteria, anxiety. It's very tough to run a family. That's what you were told. And in fact, that's what we were taught in medical school when I went back in the 80s. That changed when it was a recognition that women's symptoms are different than men's symptoms. That chest pain is unusual in many women, whereas it's much more usual in men. Now, if you go to the ER and say you're short of breath or you have belly pain, you get an EKG. It's evolved over time. As an ER doc in the 70s, if I ordered EKGs and labs, the hospital would have came down on me and said, what are you doing that for on these women with these complaints? We're going through this evolution now. Compassionate care is also from us, right? We have to also care for our physicians who feel the strain, the inability to care for you. 30% are diagnosed with depression. 50% of patients are told it's in their heads. 80% are simply told the diagnosis is unknown and it's a mystery. When I went to medical school, again years ago, but I looked at it now, this statistic is the same. That if you listen to your patients that they will tell you the diagnosis. They may not give you the right name for it, the right medical terminology, but if you listen, they will tell you. And being this sort of ER regional director guy who oversaw whatever, a half a million patients, 99.5% of all complaints besides the money, and that's different. But besides that, 99.5% of all complaints were, the doctor just didn't listen to me. So I ask you just, if they don't listen, go see someone else. Chronic Lyme disease, 200,000 Lyme disease cases per year. It is believed that that's actually not true. That's what's stated for the U.S. population. What is likely true is that it's about 10% of the population in New York. 
Guess what? That's about 200,000. The CDC only recognizes 10 to 12 percent of actual numbers are reported, so they actually recognize that it's underreported. 94 percent of all Lyme cases come from just 12 states. That is ever expanding. What is the role of co-infections? Co-infections may increase the severity of symptoms, part by suppressing, also by overlapping symptoms. Uh, Babesia as a co-infection typically causes very severe headaches. It can give you the night sweats, but guess what? So can Lyme. Anaplasma, which is another co-infection, can give you shorter breath. And upper respiratory tract infection symptoms, but guess what? So can Lyme. Borrelia can give you nerve tingling sensations and psychiatric problems. But guess what? So can Lyme. Lyme disease creates inflammation and it creates these antibody reactions where you have free radicals and oxidative stress which damages cell membranes and nerve cells. Treatment outcomes, high failure rates in late disease. Short-term antibiotics fail in 25 to 71 percent of patients. There are frequent treatment relapses and failure with short-term therapy. Treatment failure due to the persistence, the effect that there's intracellular localization, there's cystic formation, biofilms, and the fact that Lyme and other, other co-infections hide and sequester themselves into nerve tissues, joints, and muscles. The eye is one of the most difficult places to treat. People can have these very strange eye manifestations, visual manifestations. Ligamentous problems where you just feel like your joints want to just, you, that your tendons feel like they're rubber bands that want to snap. You have CNS problems where you just feel like, like you're angry and tense. And then you have feelings that you may be having a stroke sometimes, where all of a sudden your arm goes numb and weak. Now, I know I'm talking to some of you, and you are hearing yourselves. We are also here today, and you are here today, because we need your help. Physicians want to help you. Nurse practitioners want to help you. Physician assistants want to help you. That's what we do, and that's what people do. They don't want to not help you. But there is some other force that is making it more difficult. We as a group can be empowered to make a change. We as individuals are much stronger as a group. And I do implore you to get involved. Get involved with the Lyme Action Network. Get involved with all those great people over there. That basically this is all they, they do this out of the kindness of their hearts. 